Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Film Nerd Podcast. I'm Vince, and today I have a very kind of unique episode here, uh, riding this one solo, no guests, um, and it's something that I haven't done before, and that's kind of talk about an entire franchise of movies and give you my thoughts and my rankings. Something that I might explore a little bit more in the future, um, kind of ranking films either in a franchise or uh, from a director. I know there's some big name directors with some new movies coming out this year, and it might be something fun that I looked into doing, uh, look into doing later this year. Um, watching or binge watching an entire director's filmography or a franchise and kind of talking about my thoughts as a whole on it and, and rankings and things like that. So we'll see if I continue to do it. So this is kind of a one-off for now, but it's something that I might do again later on. And so the franchise I want to talk about today uh, is a franchise that uh, until, uh, let's see, July, June, excuse me, until June 26th, so a couple of weeks ago, I had never seen a single one of these movies, ever. Um, I think maybe I might have watched one of them a long time ago, and I don't really remember it. Um, at least not enough on rewatch. And that is the Fast and the Furious franchise. Um, so back in, I don't know, maybe when I was 12, 13, 14, I think I might have watched Tokyo Drift. Uh, one of my friends said that maybe I watched it at his house a while ago as I was ranking these and talking about it on social media. He was like, hey, you watched this one at my house back in the day i was like yeah i must not have paid close attention because upon rewatch i didn't really remember much of it but um i had just been hearing for years people telling me to finally watch these movies i kind of scoffed at them and um didn't want to ever give them a chance didn't really think they were something i would enjoy watching um just thought they looked stupid and, and something that you know at 10 movies deep with the new one that just came out that i didn't really want to you know, dive into, didn't want to embark on this journey, but, uh, I was convinced, um, by someone that, uh, I follow and, and communicate with and talk about movies with on Twitter, Simon, Simon on film. He, um, had been promoting the fast and furious movies. I kind of trust him in his opinions. Uh, don't agree with him on everything, but, uh, I thought these movies were pretty dumb, but he kept talking them up. So I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll finally dive in. And the first two were on HBO Max, Fast and the Furious, The Fast and the Furious, and Too Fast, Too Furious. The very first two films were on HBO Max, so I decided I would dive in. Well, from uh, June 26th until last week, uh, Thursday, July 8th, I watched all 10. Um, I got to see F9 in theaters. I went to see the Fast and the Furious 9 or Fast 9, the Fast Saga, whatever the hell it's called. I uh, went over to my local NCG last Thursday by myself at one o'clock. There was like only a dozen other people there. And the very first Fast and the Furious movie I'd ever seen uh, on the big screen, the ninth installment, technically the 10th film, if you count the Hobbs and Shaw movie I watched in theaters last Thursday. So what are my thoughts on this overall? Well, I got to be honest. I had a lot of fun with these. I didn't think I would enjoy them. Um, again, I scoffed at them for years. I thought they looked pretty stupid. Um, but what makes them fun and enjoyable is they know they're stupid. Um, they know that they know exactly what they are. They're very tongue in cheek. They're basically you take you start off with the first couple movies that goes from this very unique kind of niche niche. I never know how to say that word niche franchise um, of this car culture with kind of crime elements mixed in. And then to see over 10 movies that evolve into this like you know, basically superheroes, faux superheroes with car franchise. I mean, $200 million blockbuster soap opera movies with cars. I mean, they know exactly what they are. The The stunts and the action sequences get more and more ridiculous. They, they, they know they're more and more ridiculous. That's kind of the whole point um, to the point where in this new movie, they completely acknowledge that they just can't seem to die. Um, I'm not really going to spoil. If you haven't seen the new one, I'm not going to spoil any of these movies. I'm just going to kind of talk about them briefly and give you my my overall thoughts and then my rankings. I'll kind of walk through each one as I rank them. Um, but yeah, I, I got to tell you, I for the most part, I enjoyed pretty much all of these. The one that I'm going to give you my last, my least two favorites as I go through, I'm going to rank them all from least favorite to favorite. Um, the one, the two that are at the bottom, I didn't like. Everything else, I enjoyed. Um, quite a bit actually i pretty much other than the bottom two i liked every, the others a lot um again they they know exactly what they are and they're just a ton of fun um they're stupid they're hilarious i mean i was dying laughing at this new one in theaters i was dying laughing at home 
as each subsequent sequel just gets more and more ridiculous. The dialogue and the acting, um, you know, it, it's not bad in the traditional sense. It's just so, it's like a soap opera. It's just so tongue in cheek. It's just, it's like they're winking at you the entire time you're watching these movies. It's like, yeah, we know what we're doing. We know these movies aren't like, you know, art house films. You know, we know they're not very smart, but damn it, we're going to give you some incredible action sequences that get so over the top by the ninth film, you know, and even really five through nine. I mean, as I get into my rankings here, five through nine, each film just gets more and more and more ridiculous. And it's, I love it. I hope they keep going. I hope they just keep getting more and more ridiculous. There's two more movies already in the works. They apparently have a 10th uh, film that's going to be split into part one and part two coming out in the next couple of years here. I think part one comes out next year. Part two comes out the next year after that, 2022 and 2023. So we'll see. Uh, without further ado, though, here, I don't want to keep this video too long. I just wanted to talk about these movies because I did enjoy them quite a bit and thought it'd be fun to go through my rankings here. Um, so again, I'm not going to spoil any of these if you haven't seen them or if you haven't seen the new one, I'm not spoiling anything. Um, all of these movies, the very first two films, The Fast, The Furious and Too Fast, Too Furious were on HBO Max. Um, the rest I had to rent or buy. I actually ran over to, um, here in mid Michigan and Lansing, we have this great store. If you're not from here called disc traders. Um, and I ran over and disc traders for like three bucks. I got four five, six, and seven. You can see them there. If you're on YouTube, you'll see them on YouTube. I got four five, six, and seven for like three bucks each on Blu-ray. Um, three, I had to rent. And then eight, I had to rent on VOD. They weren't streaming anywhere. Um, nine, and then again, nine I saw in theaters. Eight, and then Hobbs and Shaw, I had to rent. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get into the rankings here. There's actually, I'm going to talk about 11 movies, because even though there's technically only 10, if you count Hobbs and Shaw, there's nine in the initial Fast Saga franchise, 10 if you count the offshoot with Hobbs and Shaw. But there's actually kind of a faux unofficial origin story for Han. If you're familiar with these movies, Han was introduced in Tokyo Drift. He's been in pretty much every one since. There's a couple that he's not in, I think, um, but he's in most of them. Um, but there's a movie called Better Luck Tomorrow that's directed and written, written, edited, produced, and directed by Justin Lin, who is the same mostly writer-director, I think just primarily director of uh, five of these movies now. I think he took over with Tokyo Drift. I think he did three, four, five, and six. And then he came back and just did the new one. He didn't do seven or eight, but he came back and did nine. He's doing ten. So he did four in a row, um, and then he's going to do a couple more. Well, before he got big with the Fast and Furious movies, he made a movie called Better Luck Tomorrow back in 2002. It was one of his very first films. I think it was his second official directorial effort. And uh, it's it has Han in it. It's the same actor, the characters, it's the same name, and he has retroactively gone back and said this is an unofficial origin story for Han for the Fast and Furious franchise. Uh, what's kind of weird is there's another actor in Better Luck Tomorrow um, who is named Virgil, and he's a friend of Han's in the film, who shows up in Tokyo Drift as a different character. So that's kind of weird. Um but whatever, it's it's apparently it's an unofficial part of the Fast and the Furious franchise. I watched that movie too, so I'm gonna talk. So there's technically eleven films in my ranking. All right, so to kick off this ranking, my number eleven of the eleven movies here is Hobbs and Shaw. Uh, this is the only movie. The Better Luck Tomorrow doesn't really count, but of the ten main films, to me, this is the only one that just does not get it. That really just does not understand what makes these movies so loved and so great. Um, it's the only one that's a spinoff film. It's not part of the main franchise. Um, and it's the only one that also doesn't include any of the original members of the family. <laughs> you gotta love family. <laughs> as long as you got family. Um, it's just Hobbs and Shaw, right? It's Deckard Shaw and what is his name? Luke Hobbs, Dwayne Johnson, and um, Jason Statham. And Honestly, this is pretty bad. Uh, I don't like this movie at all. I gave it a two out of five on Letterboxd, so like a three and a half or like a four. I'd give it like a four out of ten. Um, the movie completely misses the point in terms of what makes these movies work. It just it tries to force humor in, whereas these the other movies are funny because they're not trying. Like they're not trying to be funny. Um, they have this super melodramatic dialogue and super tongue in cheek 
um, action sequences and over the top stuff that ends up being hilarious, sometimes by accident, but sometimes it's self aware. Whereas Hobbs and Shaw is completely like the other way, where they're trying to force in jokes, they're trying to hit that lowest demographic with even having Kevin Hart and Ryan Reynolds doing their shtick. Both of them are just being themselves. It's not even a character. It's just a caricature of them. And it's so unfunny. This movie also has probably the most dick jokes I've ever heard in a major Hollywood blockbuster film, a $200 million movie. And they're so they're so tiresome. And it's not funny at all. I didn't laugh once watching this. There are some really good action sequences that I enjoyed. Um... There are some ridiculous over-the-top action sequences, but this movie's so long. Uh, it is two hours and fifteen minutes, just about. And there's some there's some movies in this franchise that are much longer, but this movie doesn't earn its runtime. A lot of it's fluff that's filled out with these awful dialogue sequences and like monologues from Ryan Reynolds and Kevin Hart that are exposition heavy and have all this forced humor, and it's just I. I really didn't enjoy watching this at all. I was uh, struggling to stay awake and I kind of wanted to turn it off a couple of times. Um, again, there's a few action sequences that are fun. Uh, if you really love the franchise, maybe it's worth checking out, but this to me, it's the worst one. It's not good at all. Uh, my number 10 is the fourth film Fat. just, it's just called fast and furious. It's Justin Lin's second effort. Um, this is another one that Justin Lin did four of these movies in a row. And I think he was trying to figure out the right formula um, because he took over with Tokyo Drift, the third film. And the first two movies in this franchise, excuse me, were pretty, like, simple um, in the fact that they were just this these car culture movies with kind of this goofy dialogue and all this pop music and some crime elements thrown in. And then Tokyo Drift, Justin Lin came into Tokyo Drift and moved it away from America, moved it over to Japan, kind of got this, the franchise a little bit more worldly. And that that movie is very simple. And then Fast and Furious, he got really melodramatic. Um, he tried to get like really emotional and serious, and it ended up being really boring. Um, and a lot of the action sequences in this one and number four, Fast and Furious, are super CGI heavy. Whereas five, particularly five and six, have a lot of practical effects, a lot of real stunt work. And this fourth entry, it's so heavy on the CGI, so heavy on the melodrama and like super self-serious. It ends up being really boring. Um, I do like it better than Hobbs and Shaw. Um, I'd give this one like a five out of ten. Maybe a five and a half. Uh, just because it has the original cast. It does have Brian O'Connor. It does have uh, Toretto. Um, you know, Vin Diesel as Toretto. It does have a lot of the main, you know, characters that you love and enjoy, but it's just not very good. I thought it was pretty boring. Uh, my number nine on the list is the unofficial origin story for Han from Justin Lin. Uh, he wrote and directed, edited, produced this movie. It's one of his first movies called Better Luck Tomorrow. Uh, came out back in 2002. Um, it's good. It's a good movie. It doesn't really feel like it fits in the Fast and the Furious franchise because it's basically a high school movie. It's about a group of Asian American high school students in California, I believe, um, who get into crime. So that element kind of links it. You know, the crime element definitely links it to the Fast and Furious franchise. Um, but it's much more contained. It's much more small scale and focused compared to the other films. Um, it's If you really like the character of Han, um, because Justin Lin has come out and said this is his official origin story, but in terms of the entire franchise as a whole, it doesn't really officially get counted. Um, but it is the same character. So it's worth checking out. Um, this one actually is streaming on Amazon Prime. I didn't have to rent this one. It's streaming. If you have Amazon Prime, it's included on there with your subscription. So um, a lot of style from Justin Lin as an early director in this movie. A lot of interesting editing choices. Um, it's very dark. Um, it's like a dark comedy. There's some very uh, kind of dark things that happen in this movie, especially towards the end. Um, but yeah, it's good. It's a good movie. I give it like a six and a half, seven out of 10. Solid. Um, I enjoyed it. I don't know if I'd watch it again. Maybe. Um, next movie that I have on my list, number eight, is the second one. Too Fast, Too Furious. Um, I like this movie. It's fun. It's really stupid. Um, as dumb as the original one is, I think this one's even dumber. Um, I mean, the opening is just so silly. Uh, Ludacris comes out with his enormous 
two it just straight out of the early 2000s afro you got early 2000s rap music pumping um the neon cars all the girls dress skimpy um and it has a really silly opening street race um tyrese gibson obviously as roman pierce gets introduced in this one um and they go to is it miami they're down in miami now um this movie gets really silly as they try to retroactively like fit it into the franchise as they get into kind of the weird timeline situation after the third movie uh this one i kind of think fits awkwardly into the franchise but whatever uh toretto's not in this one obviously if you've watched these movies um because at the end of the first one he's like in hiding um this one's good it's fun it knows what it is it's very silly very over the top i like that it's simple it's simple and contained to me this one's like a good seven out of ten um you know not a seven out of ten in the traditional sense more of a seven out of ten in entertainment it's very entertaining um it's very laid back you know you just sit back enjoy it be entertained laugh at how stupid it is i have a good time with this one uh next on the list number seven is tokyo drift um, going into this franchise, uh, reading up on a lot of people don't like Tokyo Drift. I don't know why. It's a lot of fun. It's again like the second one. It's very simple, very contained story. Super like weird and unnecessary setup. Um, like Lucas Black, who I really like as an actor. He's not very good in this. I like him as a person more as an actor. I think he's pretty good as as um um. Mike Winchell, the quarterback in the movie Friday Night Lights 2004, you know, would have came out a couple years before this movie. But this actor is like 25, 24 years old, and he's supposed to be playing a 17 year old, and he already has like a really thick beard. It's even funnier. Um, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but they do bring him back later in the series without kind of telling you which movie and how. Um, but it's funny if you think that he's supposed to be like 18 or 19 years old and he's like 30 something at that point. So that's kind of goofy. Um, but like this whole setup for this movie doesn't really make any sense. Like the fact that he, again, why is he to be 17? Why is he to be in high school? And the story is like, he's getting kicked out of high school in America and he gets sent to live with his dad who has never really explored very well over in Tokyo. He's just living in Japan, uh, because apparently he's like escaping past demons, but they never really explore his dad's past or his relationship with his dad very well. Um, outside of that, the whole premise and setup, the rest of the movie is a lot of fun. Great music. The music's really, really fun. A um, lot of cool car sequences in this one that, again, are very simple. Um, this is very low stakes compared to the later movies. Much more low stakes and contained. Uh, obviously, you get the introduction of Han, who's one of my favorite characters in the franchise. He gets introduced in this movie in Tokyo Drift. Um, but yeah, I like this one quite a bit. I think this one's a solid seven, seven, uh, seven and a half out of 10 for me. Um, it's still one of the weaker movies, but yeah, I definitely look forward to watching this one again. Um, and I don't see why people dislike this one. I like that. It's so small scale contained again, super tongue in cheek, a lot of fun. This was Justin Lin's first outing in the franchise. Um, yeah. Tokyo drift. Uh, number six, I have the fate of the furious. So the eighth film, um, I have pretty low, uh, still enjoy it a lot. I give it a four out of five on letterbox, even though I have it low on the ranking, I still like it a lot. Um, this one is hard to watch. Obviously this was the first entry in the franchise with Paul Walker being gone. Obviously they had the big outing with him in furious seven. And then in the fate of the furious, the eighth film, he's not in this one. Um, his absence is missed quite a bit. They don't do a ton to kind of cover up that absence. Um, when I get to the, the new movie, I'll talk about how they do kind of explore the other characters in an interesting way that kind of makes you forget somewhat about Brian O'Connor. Kind of, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, adding Charlize Theron in this movie is great. I really like her as the villain. She's pretty terrifying. She's not very well developed, I felt like, um, but she brings a pretty chilling performance. She's a lot of fun. Um, Jason Statham. Obviously, is Deckard Shaw um, in one of the previous entries. He's introduced in an earlier film, but he kind of joins the team in this one, along with Owen Shaw, his brother. It's kind of fun having the Shaw brothers in on this uh, entry. Um, super over-the-top sequences in this one that continue to make it fun. Um, I, I really enjoyed this one quite a bit. It, I think some of the uh, entries that I'm going to mention higher on my list are better, uh, that I like quite a bit better. Um, this one's kind of visually dull too. They spend a lot of time in Russia later in the movie. And so like, it's just a lot of bleak gray, white snow. So it's, it visually gets kind of boring, even though there's a lot of exciting 
chase sequences and action sequences that couple those visuals. It's still kind of a boring visual entry. Um, a lot of the other entries that are higher on my list have a lot more interesting visuals, interesting locations. But yeah, I still enjoyed this one. Um, there's some interesting character dynamics too, without spoiling anything if you haven't seen this one. There's some interesting character dynamics that come up with Dom Toretto that I that I enjoyed that continues into the new movie, which is will be later in my rankings. Okay, uh, moving on here. Number five, The Fast and the Furious, the original one. So the very first movie I have number five on my list. I like the original one a lot. Uh, the original one, just like two and three, is very simple, very small scale, very low stakes. Um, and I like that it's like, it came out in 2001 and it's so 2001. I mean, the way it's edited, the way it's visuals are super fast paced and frenetic energy. Uh, like any crime movie you would see in the early 2000s. It reminded me a lot of Man on Fire with Denzel, a Tony Scott movie with Denzel um, in terms of very like frantic editing. Um, again, early 2000s movie. Um, it's super campy. I love how this movie just right away sets how campy and like tongue in cheek and soap opera esque, how self aware it is, doesn't take itself too seriously. It's just dumb. It's good, dumb fun. And um, the car chase sequences, the action set pieces are a lot of fun. There's a lot of goofy pop music from this time period that that's, that fits. It feels like it works. It just fits. A lot of hilarious, dumb one liners. Um, and it's an overall fun and entertaining story. And I do, by the end of the movie, I do really like a lot of the characters. And obviously those characters and their relationships and those dynamics continue for nine, eight more movies after this. So I, I you know, I had a lot of fun with it. It's dumb. It's fun. It's entertaining. Um, you know, just like this one and the fate of the fierce, the last one, I'm seven and a half, eight out of 10. Yeah. Seven and a half, eight out of 10. I like them a lot. I look forward to rewatching. All right. Number four on my list, my top four here. I really love, I really love these movies a lot. Uh, they're dumb, but Oh man, the action scenes are so great. Number four is furious seven. Uh, my number four, three and two here. I'm having a hard time ranking them. And even the one I put at number one. So these top four, they're not really set in stone. I've only seen these movies all one time. If I rewatch them, these top four might get reordered. Um, but to me, these top four are the four best movies in this franchise, starting with Furious 7 here at my number four spot. But again, don't take it, you know, take it with a grain of salt because I've only seen these one time as much as I really enjoyed them after one viewing. After a second movie, they could shuffle around a bit. Um, but number four... Uh, was the first my number four on the list is Furious Seven, the seventh movie in the franchise. Obviously, this was the first one um, not to be Justin Lin since the second movie. Justin Lin did three, four, five, and six, and then they brought in James Wan, director of the Conjuring movies and Insidious films, um, to do Furious Seven. Uh, right away, the opening sequence in Furious Seven is awesome. Uh, without spoiling anything, uh, it introduces Owen or Deckard Shaw. Owen Shaw's brother, who's played, Deckard Shaw's played by Jason Statham. In this movie, he's the villain. Like I mentioned earlier in The Fate of the Furious, he kind of teams up with them. Kind of a spoiler, but at this point, if you haven't seen these movies, I don't know what to tell you. Um, you know, I try, try not to spoil some things, but to describe some of the stuff, it's kind of hard. Um, I like this one a lot. Um, there's a couple that I like a little bit more, but again, on subsequent viewings, it might change. Um, I really like James Wan's directorial style. Um, I love what he does with the camera. Um, I think he's a really good director. I love what he does with Conjuring movies, Insidious films. Um, I liked what he did with Aquaman, even though that's a pretty dumb movie. It's a lot of fun uh, from a direction standpoint. Um, I, I like what he brings here. This, this movie continued from the previous entries to up the insanity in terms of the action set sequence. Set the action set sequence. Jeez, oh, beats. The action sequences and the set pieces. I combine those two phrases. Um, the one thing that the reason this one's a little bit lower than my next few is because this one has a lot of CGI, whereas the next few rely a lot more on practical effects and stunts. Um, and this one is a little bit more serious. Um, I gave this one four and a half out of five stars. It was going to be a four out of five, but the ending, um, which is very serious, but it works. Obviously, this was the last entry to have Paul Walker, any filmed footage of Paul Walker. Um, as most everyone knows in 2013, they were only a month into shooting this movie and um, 
Paul Walker died in a single car accident. They ended up having to delay the release till 2015 um, because they basically once they decided to get, you know, they took a few months off, you know, because of the funeral and to figure out what the heck to do. And they ended up reworking the entire film. They had to rewrite most of the film um, to take his sequences, make them make sense, bring in his brothers as stunt doubles to kind of finish filming some scenes um, and, you know, put his face, CGI his face on them. And, you know, trying, I don't even remember reading how they pieced together some dialogue. I think it was like archive dialogue. Maybe some of his brothers tried to record some dialogue if they sounded similar to him. But um, they, it's a, basically a farewell to Brian O'Connor as the character, right? And um, I, without spoiling anything, how they did it, I think is really good uh, for this franchise. I thought it made sense. And I thought it's the most respectable way to do it that, you know, people would enjoy for his character. And I can see why this movie so well liked. Um, this is one of the most liked in the franchise from critics and from audiences. I can see why. Um, this one also, great villain with Deckard Shaw. A um, lot of fun, crazy over-the-top action sequences. Um, really enjoy the silly dialogue. And uh, the emotional aspect of this one, too, is really great. And I, 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 you know, I bumped it up to four and a half stars. To me, it's like an eight and a half. Solid eight and a half out of ten. Yeah, I really like this one. Uh, the next one is... The next two, so my number three is Fast Five, and my number two is Fast and Furious Six. Um, five and six to me are interchangeable on my list. I have them at three and two. If I rewatch them, they could flip. Um, I think they're both fucking great. Uh, Fast Five is the first movie in this franchise to kind of take it to where it is now. Um, like I mentioned, the first two movies, first three movies are very contained, very simple stupid car culture movies with some crime elements but they're very small scale really goofy uh four is when they tried to take it you know to the next level to these like worldly you know almost action spy movies mission impossible type movies but four is not quite there yet and it's very melodramatic and serious five though is when like fast five is like um oh what did i write in my review here it's 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 really like Mission Impossible. Um, you know, th this is when they're they're down in Brazil. They're kind of starting. These this is where five is when they finally start to get around the world. Um, it kind of takes that emotional weight of the fourth movie because there is some more of that emotional weight with the characters. It brings in the campiness and the silly, goofy one-liners and dialogue from the first three, and then it adds in this mix of just these insane action stunt sequences, and it's a heist movie. Um, it's it's almost like a Western because it's complete with a train robbery. It's like a team up. They're getting the, together this team from all around the world, um, from previous characters, from previous movies. And uh, yeah, they, they set up this incredible heist that ends with one of the most jaw-droppingly hilarious, but incredibly well done final acts in a movie I've ever seen. And it's, it's all re mostly real. Um, you can look up the footage and the, uh, the stunts. The practical effects, um, without spoiling how they, you know, what the stunt is, they use a vault attached to some cars, and it's mostly done for real. Um, and they actually destroyed hundreds of cars doing the sequence, and uh, it's jaw jaw. I mean, it's incredible. Um, the train heist sequence is a lot of fun too. I mean, this movie is just so great. Um, and the next one, my number two on the list, Fast and Furious Six, to me, I, on rewatch, I don't know. These movies could jump each other because five and six to me are the best two in the series. In terms of, in terms of maxing out the best aspect of these series, of this series, and obviously I have one more on my list that I've talked about yet. Uh, but five and six, to me, find the balance between being campy and silly and that soap opera goofiness, while also having insane practical effects. I mean, there's not. I mean, they have to use some CGI, obviously, but there's a lot of these stunts in number six five and six that they're doing for real um six i have a little bit higher just because i like the villain of owen shaw a lot five doesn't really have a very good villain the heist that they're performing six has the villain of owen shaw so owen and deckard shaw are brothers owen shaw is played by jason statham i never remember the actor's name for owen shaw what is his name it is owen shaw is played by luke evans okay yeah luke evans and um yeah, he's the villain in this one, and um, I think he, he brings a, an interesting dynamic. It's just like Five. It's a team-up movie. Um, this one kind of feels 
this one's not a heist movie. Five is a heist movie. This one's more like it feels like Mission Impossible or James Bond, where it's kind of like the spy element. And, you know, it's very worldly. I mean, they're like going all around the world. And that's carried over into seven, which I already mentioned. Um, but yeah, I like this one a lot, too. Um, hilariously, again, over the top action set pieces, fights, explosions, destruction. Um, I, I like the cat and mouse element. This one has kind of a cat and mouse element in it as well. Um, but yeah. I think five and six are where this franchise really found its footing and seven and eight were lower on my list, but I still really like seven. Eight's a lot lower, but I still enjoyed eight a lot. And uh, without further ado, my number one on this list is the new one. F nine is my number one. Now I've only watched it once. I saw it in theaters last Thursday. So it's been today's Wednesday. It's been almost a week since I watched it, um, but I loved it. I was dying laughing in the theaters. There's about a dozen other people in the theater with me. Um, and I don't think they were getting the same enjoyment <laughs> Out of this. I was so I was trying not to laugh when it was quiet, but man, I was about peeing my pants laughing. Uh, they're full on damn superheroes in this movie. I won't spoil anything because especially this just came out, it's only been out for a few weeks, so I won't spoil anything if you haven't seen it yet. Um, but they're full on freaking superheroes. I mean, there's literally a, a sequence where Roman Pierce, Tyrese, char- Tyrese Gibson's character, this isn't really a spoiler, but he's like fully having a conversation with Ludacris's character, uh, Tej about how they're like basically invincible and like what does it mean and i love i love that meta aspect of it i saw some people's reviews that they didn't like that they were like now fully acknowledging like the online discourse of these films that the movie's like starting to be that self-aware i love it be more self-aware continue to to take this franchise to these heights of absolute i mean this this movie takes everything that i've mentioned that i love and just amplifies it even more and they're, they're like, do it with a smile. It's almost like they're looking right in the camera and smiling at you and winking with how, I mean, the third act of this movie, even the opening, the opening sequences of this movie are so ridiculous. I mean, I was dying. I'm, I'm like full on guffawing, laughing out loud. And there's people near me that I like, I don't know if they realize that my enjoyment is just how stupid this movie is. Um, and they're without ruining anything there. I won't spoil anything. There is a really cool emotional element um, um, with a character that even if I don't mention his name, you'll probably know what, who I'm referencing, but I won't spoil anything. There's a, actually, there's a couple characters that they have some really cool emotional things they do with them. Um, some interesting character dynamics. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it um, on top of all the silliness, the campiness, the soap opera goofiness, uh, the family, the Coronas. I mean, the Coronas and the family shit cracks me up. I love it. Um, yeah, the stunts are incredible. John Cena's add to this movie. His character dynamic as the villain in this one is a lot of fun. Really, excuse me, really enjoyed it. Um, they take Dominic Toretto's character. Without spoiling anything, they take his character to new heights. They add some more depth to him, some more backstory to his character. That's some of it's, again, very soap opera-esque. Um, I don't know if I call it bad acting, but it feels like it's straight out of a soap opera. And uh, it's great. I love these $200 million blockbuster franchise movies that I was trying to describe to some people why I think these movies work. And I think it's because these movies are, they're not that original. They take a lot of pieces to me from 80s action movies, being super campy and goofy and self-aware and having you know some bad dialogue that makes you laugh. But having a lot of practical stunts, practical effects, and uh, amazing action sequences. But these movies are $200 million. I mean, they're way more expensive than any of those 80s action movies that they're drawing influence from. They feel, some of these later ones feel like they're taking, you know, from James Bond and Rambo and Mission Impossible. um, You know, and what else? Anything with um, pretty much anything... um, you know, any of those major action movies you can think of from the 80s, the most popular ones, even in the 90s, feels like Face Off, you know, the the Nick Cage and John Travolta, like elements of that movie from the 90s, like takes all of these really hilarious but popular 80s action movies, gives them $200 million so that they can just up the insanity of all the action sequences uh, and just completely... You know, it's just this, and also at the same time, it's a team up movie. You got all these characters who some of them aren't very fleshed out at this point, but some of them are, and you really care about them and enjoy them. Um, it's just, it's dumb, pulpy, soap opera, blockbuster action fun, but it's done well. I don't know. I guess that's the best way I can describe it. I don't know. 
I scoffed at these movies for years. I thought they were stupid. I didn't think I'd ever get into them. Now that I've been watching them for the first time, I can't wait to watch them all again. Um, like I mentioned early in this video, there's some that I don't enjoy very much. Uh, the Hobbs and Shaw one, I think, is bad. The fourth one, Fast and Furious, I think is pretty bland. Um, Better Luck Tomorrow, which is unofficially in this franchise because of Han origin story. It's worth watching one time. Um, Too Fast, Too Furious is all right. It's pretty solid. Um, past that, though, the rest I really love a lot. I think they're pretty great. And F9, uh, to me, I gave F9 five out of five stars in Letterboxd. I don't think this is a perfect 10 out of 10 movie, but I gave it five stars because I... For what I want out of these movies, I think it is perfect. For a Fast and Furious movie, I think it was perfect. I mean, I might even up my my one for six, for five, and even maybe seven to a five out of five at some point. Because I really do think five, six, seven, and nine, maybe not so much seven, but definitely five, six, and nine, pretty much perfect what I want out of these movies. Exactly what I'm looking for. Over the top incredibly stupid but entertaining action sequences the dumb campy tongue-in-cheek dialogue uh the family stuff uh vin diesel you know dominic trails one-liners uh i love the memes you gotta love the memes coming out of these movies right now uh but they're fun if you've never watched them before hey i had never seen a single one i scoffed at them i'm kind of a movie snob you know, I got on my shelf by me here how many indie movies and art house movies that are some of my favorites, foreign films. But uh, yeah, for stupid Hollywood over the top action blockbuster movies, $200 million movies, they just, they know exactly what they're doing. And I love every second of it. Uh, like I've already mentioned to me, they just feel like 80s, like tongue in cheek action movies perfected at a $200 million level, way more money. But uh, yeah, so that's my thoughts on the Fast and the Furious franchise. Again, I'd never seen a single one. Watched them all in less than two weeks. Um, I wanted to make this video a week ago, but I've had a lot of stuff on my plate. I was sick. My daughter, my infant daughter was sick. My one-year-old son on top of that, just a handful. And then a lot of other stuff going on. So wanted to make this video a week ago, but I'm getting it done now. So hope you enjoyed me talking about uh, my first time watching all these movies. Uh, my rankings, let me know if you agree, if you disagree, but those are my, uh, yeah, those are my thoughts. Those are my rankings. And uh, I'm looking forward to the 10th film. Apparently that this, the F9 was supposed to come out last year. They delayed a year because of the pandemic. And the 10th one was supposed to come out this year. Part one. It's supposed to be a part one and part two for the 10th movie. Um, so part one, I think is going to be out next year. Like I think there's only going to be a one year gap between nine and 10. So I think it's supposed to come out 2022. And then I think part two comes out the very next year, 2023. So we'll see. I don't know. We might have another movie coming very soon. So anyway, I'll be back very soon. Um, I got some other stuff in the works here. I am actually going to do a crossover episode with another podcast, uh, sleepers podcast, basketball podcast on the space jam movies. They're basketball guys. So we're talking about some basketball movies here coming up soon. Um, I have a classics review with my buddies, um, there will be blood that should be coming out pretty soon. And then I got to talk about what I watched in June. I haven't done my, my June video of all the movies I watched in June. So uh, thanks for joining. Thanks for listening. Or if you watch, thanks for watching along here. Uh, again, some of those uh, episodes look for here very soon. And got to continue my Lord of the Rings uh, conversations too. Uh, there should be another episode on that in about a, a month here or so. Uh, but until next time, I'm Vince, Film Nerd Podcast. Go watch some movies. <laughs>